that was a mission today. Tidal Rivers, check this out. You're probably thinking, what a ridiculous location, but I'm here for one reason, to catch a carp. This is the River Crouch. It's like all the sort of urban locations, extremely interesting, very different, and varies from day to day. The stock of fish, who knows where they come from? There's a number of commercials and syndicates that run the full length and breadth of, of, of the River Crouch. And I suppose over the years, when the river's flooded and stuff and the lakes have flooded, the fish have sort of crossed over and managed to make their way in here. And this is now their natural environment. And they're very happy here, you know. Uh, personally, I've had them to sort of mid doubles, but I know other guys that have had them to around the sort of mid 20 mark. So a very, very impressive fish from, from such a small and unique venue. What makes this extremely different and interesting is not only is it a river, but it's tidal. And that means twice a day the tide rises and drops back down again as the, as the sea washes in and out. Bringing in with it salt water and some other species, things like flounder, mullet, eels. All in all, it makes for a real different and varying venue. Anyway, the tide's on its way out, and this is a great opportunity for me to have a real good look at the river, locate any sort of snags, structures, obstacles, and place my rig ready for those fish that move into the area. The reason I've picked this particular spot and not somewhere else up and down the length of the river is because of this bridge. As you can see, this is a big structure. When, when the builders and the construction team came in here to sort of build this, they excavated this area out slightly deeper than everywhere else. And this makes a natural sort of food lava holding point for the fish. It's also a little bit deeper, so they feel a little bit more safe here. So I'm gonna start off the session here, get a couple of rods out, and let's see what happens. Right, I'm going to get this last rod set up and I'll be able to sit down and have a bite to eat. The rods I'm using today are particularly short. You know, normally I'll be out with a 12 foot rod or sometimes in extreme circumstances I might use 13, but today I'm using a nine foot rod and the main reason for this is because I'm fishing underneath this road bridge. First couple of times I came down here and fished, I came down with 12 foot rods and it is an absolute nightmare when you do work a fish, you're trying to play it and it's just chaos, the fish scrap really hard because the water's particularly shallow anyway and uh, that coupled with a, a tip scratching along the surface of the, the bridge, it just worked out the one. So I've gone for nice short rods for sort of easy use. You know, I'm not casting very fast, just an underarm flip. Um, something else that's really important, I mentioned when I first got here, is this particular bridge, like lots of bridges, it's used for fly tipping. You've got geezers pulling over in their motors, chucking all the stuff off the back of their transits. So down here you've got tyres, you've got road cones, you've got road signs, you've got big bits of metal structures, concrete, everything. It really is a bit of a minefield, so I'm gonna to have to use some form of snag leader. Uh, I've opted for a 25 pound uh, fluorocarbon leader and I'm just gonna use that to act as a real point of abrasion if I do manage to hook against any of these sort of sharper objects that are down there. Coupled that, I'm gonna use uh, a running rig. Uh, that's because, again, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of smaller fish in here, mullets, flounders and eels and uh, they tend to want to pick the baits up a lot and move about with them and if I fish with a big heavy fixed lead I'm not getting that indication and there can be circumstances where one of these will pick the bait up I'll never know it's hooked uh, until I reel in at the end of the session and I've wasted a chance on that rod so I'm using a running lead to maximise my indication and finally I'm using a nice big long missing link hook link and I'm breaking that up into sections uh, and that's because of all these obstacles that are out there I want it to sort of follow the contours of everything that it's laying over a few blobs of putty along that just to keep it all nicely pinned down Anyway, I'm going to get this rod set up and you can see what I'm doing. Right, so first up I'm going to join my main line to my fluorocarbon leader. Uh, I'm using a simple combi knot to do this. As I said, I'm just joining it with a simple four turn combi knot. Making sure I wet everything, bed it down give it a real good pull. You know, this is such a vital knot. This is, you know, what's gonna be put under a lot of tension in the battle and stuff. So it's really important to make sure it's sufficient and strong. I'm then gonna pull off probably about four meters of fluorocarbon. And just run it 
between my fingers and thumbs. And this is just to take out a lot of the memory because it's been cooled up on the spool. Sort of run it between your fingers and thumbs, heat it up, create a bit of friction. And that just makes it nice and smooth and more supple. Right, that's the leader sorted out. Next one goes the lead. As I mentioned, I'm using a running lead. Uh, I'm not just going to drop that directly onto, onto the main line, uh, onto the leader, sorry. I'm actually going to use a small bead there. One, it allows it to sort of glide up and down the line a lot easier. And two, it also allows me mid-session to change the weight of the lead if I require to. Now, this particular session, when I'm fishing this tidal river, because the river's going up and down, because of that and the force of the water that's coming up here, I've got to change my lead sizing accordingly. You know, at the moment, I can quite happily, you know, fish with a, a one and a half, two ounce lead, and that's holding bottom, not a problem. But probably in two or three hours' time, when that water's really pushing through, I'm going to have to significantly up the lead size to, to enable me to hold bottom. So this very simple bead here, it allows me to pop the lead and the swivel in there, and then I can just drop a pin in place. When I want to sort of change the lead later on in the session, I can pop the pin out, remove this, and put a different size lead in. So a real useful bead for fishing, fishing with a running rig setup. So I'll drop one of those on the line. Next up is just a simple bead that will protect my swivel, um, and just sort of neat in the whole setup. Uh, and then I'm just going to tie onto here uh, a, a swivel. As I said, I'm going to go for a nice light lead at the moment because there's not a lot of flow out there. This one's two ounces, so I'll pop that on. I want a bit of weight there, you know, I want it to, to, to help pull that hook in. Uh, and finally, I'm going to attach my rig. Like I said, I'm using a really, really long rig, um, a lot longer than I'd normally use. Uh, and my main thinking and reasoning for that is because uh, of all those obstacles out there, I want something to lay over everything. So I'm going to get a nice long length of coated braid. Strip a bit back, ready for attaching my hook. So uh, on a couple of the rods I've got standard sort of 15mm bottom baits, but the bait that really does tend to, to, to catch the fish and catch the fish a lot quicker is maggots or worms. This particular rig I'm going to tie up now, I'm going to tie up for, as, it, as if I was fishing a worm rig. Tie a knot that's not, laying it along the shank, whip up the shank, eight times, back over a couple of times, and down through. I'm using a size eight Fang X, uh, and I'm just gonna put a little sort of kicker on the end of there just to help turn that hook. Cut this off, nothing complicated, nice and simple. Because I'm traveling light, I haven't got a, a stove with me, a stove and a, any water or anything. Normally I'd use a little bit of shrink chew, but in circumstances like this, a tiny little hook link sleeve, if you just snip 5mm, 7mm off the end, whack that on the needle, slide it down the hook link, just pop that over the end. It's a nice, simple, neat, quick way of doing a similar job to shrink tube. As I mentioned, I'm actually going to break these sections up here so they follow the bottom a little bit better. I'm just using a little tool here that strips back a section, go along another couple of inches, strip back another tiny little bit, another couple of inches, all the way up your hook link. And I'll just finish that off, double overhand knot. Spread that out along the length. Right, so there it is, the finished rig. Hook, disjointed sections, a coated braid that will lay nicely over everything they land on the bottom. Right, as I mentioned, I'm going in with the worms. Proper carp food. Anyway, I'm gonna take a nice big juicy lob and I'm just gonna snip tail off it and it starts letting the juices flow out and they'll sort of be washed downstream and hopefully draw anything up. Up at this other end I'm then going to whack this hook in, 
and slide it as much as I can down the inside of the worm and pop, pop out a bit further along it like that. Push that up onto the shank like so. Now that's all good and well like that but very very quickly that worm will be wriggling around in the water and he'll actually work his way off this hook. So just to prevent that from happening I'm going to take a tiny little hook weave and I'm just going to slide that onto the hook to hold the worm in place. Nice simple running river rig. I need to get out. I've had the rods out now for a couple of hours and we've not even had an indication. Anyway, the tide's starting to come back in now and it's rising very, very quickly. So it's time to reel in, check my bait and also change the size of my lead. Uh, as I said, I started on a two ounce, I'm now gonna go up to three. I'm gonna give it an hour, another probably hour, hour and a half and then I'll have lost the light and that'll be the end of the day session. So this is it. Just look, coming down here now, coming down the river, there's a little tiny pipper sprout bat. It's absolutely awesome. It's just feeding on the little insects and the stuff that are on the surface of the water. Even though it's quite light still, it's come out this early. I can only presume they're roosting underneath this big bridge. There it is, look at that, that is epic. Ah, oh, that's made the session. Just need a carp now, but look at that little fella. How cool is that? Seriously cool, see it just skimming the surface of the water, picking up tiny, tiny little insects. Well, it's come to the end of this day session. Sadly, I haven't managed to catch a fish, but I'm gonna try and get back down over the next few days. I'll bring my smaller camera and try and make a fish to show you guys. Anyway, We'll leave it for today, watch this amazing sunset, get the rods in, and hopefully I'll see you soon at the park. The next time I got down there was actually on a feature with Ollie for Crafty Carpet Magazine. I had three absolute stunners from such a unique place. And well, it seemed rude to not get back down there again with the video cameras. Here's what I caught.